Hello, wonderful people. How's your we? Of course, that's a rather personal question and don't feel that you have to answer. Indeed, possibly best don't answer, particularly in the comments below. Nonetheless, in this, our final part of our three-part series on excretion for IGCSE, we're thinking about one of the most important functions of the kidneys, and that is osmoregulation. How much water should we put in our we, in our urine, and what is our kidney's role in this? This is our starting point to consider. The red blood cells in our body have this absolutely critical function of carrying oxygen around to our tissues from our lungs so that we can conduct aerobic respiration. And if we don't do that, we die fairly quickly. They have this shape, this beautiful biconcave shape, so that they have a very high surface area to volume ratio so that diffusion into them and out of them is fast. That's all well and good, and in an isotonic solution, that is, a solution which has the same water potential as they do, they maintain this beautiful biconcave disc shape. However, if we start mucking about with that, we run into problems. If our blood becomes hypertonic, that is, it becomes more concentrated than the red blood cells themselves, then what is going to happen is, by osmosis, water will leave the red blood cells. It will leave like this by osmosis, H2O, from a region of high water potential to a region of lower water potential because this is a concentrated solution outside. On the other hand, if our blood becomes too dilute, that is not concentrated enough, potentially water ends up going into our red blood cells more than it should. And as it does this, our red blood cells will swell up and potentially burst. Neither of these two outcomes is positive. <laughs> Both outcomes are very, very negative. Therefore, it is crucially important that the plasma of our blood remains isotonic with our red blood cells and indeed all of our other cells. Therefore, we need to carefully regulate the water potential of our blood. Our first point of regulation is the brain. The brain has two key bits here, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Both the hypothalamus and the pituitary are really close to each other in this region here. And you can find them actually quite easily with your tongue. If you press, if you press your tongue to the roof of your mouth and try to say these words, you will have your tongue really quite close physically to where they are. So do that now. You press your tongue to the roof of your mouth and you say, hypothalamus or gland, which sounds awful, of course, uh, but uh, that's the way it is with your tongue pressed to the roof of your mouth. The hypothalamus detects changes in water potential, and if it detects changes in the blood water potential, it informs the pituitary gland, which then has the role of secreting more or less ADH. Let's have a look at the pathway of that. So. Let us say that our hypothalamus has detected that the blood water potential is pretty low. There's not enough water in the blood. It has told the pituitary gland of this, and the pituitary gland will now release ADH, and that ADH will go to the kidneys. <laughs> it won't take a direct route, of course. Um, if you look here, we've got the, the brain up in this region. We're going to have to go through a whole load of blood vessels before we get to the kidneys, so I thought it would be a nice little opportunity to review the human circulatory system. Uh, we're going to start off with ADH traveling into the jugular vein. From the jugular vein, it will go into the superior vena cava, whereby it will enter the heart via the right atrium. That will go into the right ventricle, from there to the pulmonary artery, and then to the pulmonary uh, vein once it's been through the lungs, through the pulmonary circuit. Then back to the heart, into the left atrium, then to the left ventricle. You remember that very thick-walled left ventricle, which is going to contract hard and push blood all the way around the body, out through the aorta, and then from the aorta, it will enter the renal artery, and finally, it will reach its destination in the kidney. Uh, maybe it would have been better just to summarise it as this arrow, but uh, it's a nice bit of review for us. Once it gets to the kidney, then, it has its effect on our main active unit in the kidney, the nephron. You'll recall that we divided the nephron into three regions last time. 
This region, the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule, which is to do with ultrafiltration. This region here, the proximal convoluted tubule, the nearby wibbly wobbly small tube, which is to do with selective reabsorption. And then finally, the rest of the nephron, which is to do with producing concentrated urine, or if you like, varying the concentration of the urine. Our region of interest in this video is this region here of the collecting duct, going down this way. And we're interested in here because water is reabsorbed from the collecting duct back into the blood by osmosis. However, the collecting duct is also sensitive to this hormone released by the pituitary gland, ADH, or antidiuretic hormone. ADH's job is, as its name suggests, a hormone which reduces your diuretic effect, i.e. it reduces the quantity of urine you produce. And it does that by changing the amount of water we're going to reabsorb from the collecting duct. The collecting duct itself is permeable to water, but its permeability can vary. We can change its permeability. If we have greater permeability, more water is reabsorbed. If we reduce its permeability, less water is reabsorbed. How does it do that? In the presence of ADH, our cells in our collecting duct do something very clever. They produce more of these water channels called aquaporins. When your collecting duct has more aquaporins, it becomes more permeable to water. And so by osmosis, more water is returned from that urine, from the lumen of the collecting duct into your blood. Therefore, it's not lost. It's not doesn't travel down to the ureter, it doesn't travel down to the bladder and get uh, excreted away. Very clever. So if we look at it this way, we've got, let's say we have normal blood water potential and let's say you have a big drink of tea. I love drinking tea. You therefore get a higher blood water potential. That water potential is detected, that raisin water potential is detected by the hypothalamus, which in turn tells the pituitary gland, PG, which I'm going to call it here, to stop releasing ADH. Therefore, the concentration of ADH in your blood will fall pretty quickly, and as a consequence, your collecting ducts, your CDs, will become less permeable, less water is reabsorbed, and so you excrete more water in your urine. Your urine becomes more dilute and higher in volume. And of course, as you lose all this fluid, all this, as you lose all this water, your blood re returns to normal blood water potential. Now, of course, it goes the other way as well. Let's say you uh, sweat a whole load uh, because you go out for a run or something crazy like that, uh, and so you lose a lot of water. You're going to get a lower blood water potential. The hypothalamus will detect this, which in turn informs the pituitary gland. Now, now it's this moment, it's, the moment has come, it will release ADH. And in the presence of ADH, the collecting ducts become more permeable. More water is reabsorbed from the urine into the blood. You produce smaller volumes of urine and it's going to be more concentrated, that more of that kind of yellow colour. And that will return you to a normal blood water potential. Here is a little summary table. I really hope that helps. Thanks.